My grandfather, Eric Burkhorst, never talked about World War II. I could tell just by looking at him that he was still haunted by the memories. It pains me to say, however, my grandfather was a German soldier during the war, but was drafted and didn't choose to fight. I initially thought that this fact alone was why he never talked about the war, but I was wrong. After he passed, I helped my mother clean out his house. While going through some of his belongings, I discovered an old journal that my grandfather kept, which contained an unpublished memoir recounting his wartime experiences. While he didn't commit any atrocities, at least according to his memoir, my grandfather encountered something just as sinister. I've translated a section describing this very incident, one I know stuck with him the rest of his life. He titled the section, Das Armband, The Bracelet. He probably never wanted his account told, but I feel my grandfather's World War II story is one that needs to be told. Das Armband The year that I spent fighting to aid the Wehrmacht's eastern expansion exposed me to some of the worst carnage I had ever witnessed. That's why I was elated when my infantry regiment was transferred to Norlage, a village in northern France. Save the ever-constant threats from local resistant groups and RAF raids, the quiet scenic countryside was a welcome change. The townspeople, although naturally resentful towards us, seemed to know their place and were seldom unruly. What mattered most to the peasants is exactly what did before our valiant conquest. Making a living. Something that must go on for these people, war or no war. Our district's commanding officers suspected certain businesses and residents in Norlage were secretly being used as safe houses and outposts. One particular establishment was Tavern Coterie, a popular spot among both the townspeople and troops. I and some of my fellow soldiers were regulars at the tavern and became acquainted with the owners, Jean and Elise Neveu. Madame Elise was warm and personable, who took time to learn everyone's names that stepped into her tavern and always made you feel welcome. She was scorned by some locals for doing so, but Madame Elise acted very motherly towards the younger German soldiers. We think it's because she knew that we weren't here by choice, or was trying to have us let our guards down. Despite ultimately being a conquered peasant, she was on good terms with us, but knew our sentiments could shift instantly. Monsor Jean, on the other hand, was a sad, cold, and unfriendly human being. He spent most of his time behind the bar or one of the back rooms, rarely interacting with customers, and he treated his wife like a dog. I remember seeing the pain and sorrow in Madame Elise's eyes some days, as she fought to keep a smile across her face. I was at the tavern with my regular band of soldiers, Private Birch, Schultz, and Lance Corporal Welch. We were seated at our usual table nestled in one of the tavern's corners while waiting for Sergeant Jaeger, who wanted to share some news with us from the barracks. Jaeger arrived shortly after we were seated and was quickly greeted by Madame Elise. After she departed, Jaeger motioned for us to lean in closer so nobody else could hear him speak. One of Jaeger's contacts claimed that the Nebius were hiding a priceless gold diamond-encrusted bracelet, purposely dating back to the Capian dynasty. For what purpose are they storing it? Schultz asked. A post-war nest egg. Fun for the resistance. It doesn't matter. Jaeger replied. They're sitting on a vast fortune that's ripe for the taking. And I say, we make that taking ours. We were interrupted by Fiona, one of the tavern's waitresses, who brought us our round of drinks and made some coy small talk with our table. She was hard to miss with her slim proportionate figure, long curly black hair, luscious red lips, and radiant light green eyes. 
Fiona was always the most attractive and desirable woman in the tavern. But there was something about her that I absolutely detested. I learned she took men to her room upstairs for the right price and was having an affair with Monsieur Jacques. Her immorality aside, I could never adequately identify what specifically incited my resentment. And what if your source is incorrect? I asked after Fiona had parted from our table, my eyes narrowing at Yager. One of my contacts misinformed me, Yager quickly replied. They know better, Corporal. Jaeger unveiled a plan that involved us getting rich and escaping this heinous war. After the tavern closes one up and coming night, he wanted to break in and swipe the bracelet for ourselves. We would then head to the depot, dispose of our uniforms, and catch a train to Switzerland. Welch confirmed his uncle owned a large estate near Bern, where we could hide out, and sell the bracelet after the war ends. Desertion is punishable by death, Burst stated apprehensively, while we all glanced around the table, gauging each other's reactions to Yager's proposal. Only if we get caught, Yager confidently replied. Everyone at this table experienced this war as carnage firsthand. We have all sacrificed for the rage. We are all competent, honorable men that fought alongside each other and deserve better. We would be fools for passing on such a bountiful gain, and a chance to emancipate ourselves as pawns at the behest of our superiors. Before Yager could continue, Welch asked if it was wise to disclose these pivotal details at a very tavern that we intended to raid. Yager's response was so cunning. Yager's response was so cunning. It expunged any doubts I had about this plan going awry. The safest place to plot against your target is right under the noses. When he didn't receive any objections, Jager said his contact confirmed the bracelet was hidden within one of the tavern bedroom walls. Madame Elise was completely unaware of the jewel, or that Monsieur Jean and Fiona were apparently planning on eloping with the bracelet. In addition, Jager said that he could have finalized all the necessary arrangements such as disguises and transportation to the depot. He demands a cut of the loot for his help, Jager said of his contact. So, we will have to dispose of him at some point. He's just a peasant. The darkening of Jager's face insinuated how serious he was, along with ramifications should any of us retreat. While explaining the final details, a loud pop-like crackling rang throughout the tavern, causing everyone to fall silent. We all looked towards the bar as Madame Elise collapsed in a heap onto the floor, tightly holding the side of her face. Monsieur Jean's largely beefy arm was thrown across his chest, his massive hand outstretched. After striking his wife, he started viciously scolding Madame Elise about her doing what she was told. Schultz and I reacted by shooting up from our seats. However, Jager quickly halted us. We need not intervene in local affairs, gentlemen. Jager explained calmly. We could not afford any unwanted attention, given our up-and-coming mission. I knew the sergeant was correct. We watched Madame Elise struggle back to her feet, keeping her hand firmly pressed over where she was struck as blood seeped from her nose and lips. She fought back tears before fleeing into the kitchen, after which Monsieur Jean stomped into the back room. I fought to contain my escalating anger when I saw Fiona giggling, who was genuinely amused by what just happened. Still wearing that infuriating smirk across her face, she nonchalantly followed Monsieur Jean into the back room. Although the mood was clearly dampened, the tavern's boisterous chatter slowly returned. We all exhibited varied degrees of dismay and disgust after watching a large burly figure like Monsieur Jean ferociously strike his frail, delicate wife, who was one of the few townspeople that always showed us kindness. I was clearly the most distraught overseeing Monsieur Jean strike his wife, 
but became content when I thought how especially gratifying it would be to take something so valuable from such a horrid, pompous man. Three days passed before Jager signaled his plan was ready to commence. We were to rendezvous around midnight at the abandoned barn not far from the tavern. I left the barracks with Bursch, who professed his doubts and apprehension about Jaeger's plan, along with the fatal consequences of being caught. While cutting through a patch of dense woods, Bursch asked if I trusted him to not speak a word of this to anyone if he returned to the barracks. Upon realizing his intent to retreat, I was forced to kill him. I told Bursch he was right about having his doubts and I gave him my blessing, which was enough to let his guard down. The second that he turned his back, I sank the entire blade of my dagger in back of his skull. I killed many during the war, but Bursch was the first time I ever used a knife. The feeling was much more personal and intimate than a gun, which was something I never dwelled on until recently. Killing Bursch also meant a bigger cut for the rest of us, which was probably why nobody seemed profoundly impacted when I relayed the news. The others, especially Yager, knew that it had to be done. Those were the consequences. We stuck to the shadows when making our way to the tavern, which took us longer to reach but ensured that we weren't seen. Upon arriving, Yager instructed Schultz and myself to enter through the back, while he and Welch went through the front. As we crept into the back lot, Schultz and I noticed a light and some slight movement coming from the shed. I immediately knew who would be inside at this time of night. We warily approached and peered through one of the shed's windows to see the back side of Monsieur Jean standing awkwardly hunched over a table directly above Fiona's sprawled body. Monsieur Jean's pants were at his ankles, and Fiona's bare writhing legs were outstretched. It was obvious what they were doing. The sight of Fiona's slim body was admittedly an arousing and transfixing spectacle, but I managed to pull us away and told Schultz to follow my lead. Withdrawing our pistols, I kicked the shed door open as we stormed inside, demanding Monsieur Jean reveal the bracelet's location. You waste my time. I barked when Monsieur Jean emphatically denied knowing anything about a bracelet. We know about the jewel. Need I remind you all arts and riches are property of the fewer. You stand in contempt of those laws by withholding such valuables. Tell us the room where you concealed the treasure, and you will be left unharmed. Outraged at our unprecedented entry, Monsieur Jean and Fiona became imprudently aggressive. You break into my home, my business, and make false accusations and demands, threats with no proof. Monsieur Jean barked while frantically pointed at me. His growing angry disregard for authority and sense of control Monsieur Jean arrogantly seemed to believe he had reignited my hatred and boiling fury. In an emblematic gesture, I shifted my gun toward Fiona and fired a bullet that struck directly between her legs. She released a blood-curdling shriek and recoiled in pain as blood spilled across the table. Monsieur Jean shouted in terror, asking what I had done and was about to grab Fiona, during which I quickly fired a second shot, striking him in the same intimate area. You are in no place to lecture us, I said while slowly walking up to Monsieur Jean who wailed in agony and struggled to stay on his feet, using the table as support. You don't understand. Monsieur Jean shakily uttered before finally collapsing. What I understand is how undeserving you are of your kind living spouse and pricelessness of that bracelet. I said while pinning Monsieur Jean's head against the ground with my boot. Corporal, Schultz cried out making me take my eyes off of Monsieur Jean, only to see the bloody table strike us with ferocious speed. The impact launched us into the wall and shattered the table. Groggy and dazed from the strike, I looked up to see Fiona's contorting body. Her torso was rapidly bloating, 
while their face was stretching unnaturally wide, appearing as if it was about to rip apart and form two additional heads. She took deep, grumbly breaths that barely sounded human, and started making stiff, mechanical stopping steps in her direction. Before I could react, Schultz rose to his feet. Brandishing a metal pole, he released a frantic battle cry and blindly charged towards Fiona, who instinctively grabbed the pole when Schultz attempted to swing. Clenching his neck with her other hand, she lifted Schultz's struggling body, her tightening grip crushing his windpipe and reducing Schultz's screams to a faint, hiss-like gargle. Trapped in a fear-induced, paralytic trance, I watched Fiona clench the skin beneath Schultz's chin and slowly peel the layer off of his face. Schultz's limbs squirmed and twitched until his entire face was torn off, after which Fiona proceeded to savagely tear off his arms and chunks of his torso. I finally managed to utter, No! That caused her to drop Schultz's dismembered body. As I raised to my feet, Fiona's morphine head looked upwards and made a twitch-like gesture, which seemed to snap the wooden support beam running across the ceiling in two, and bring down the shed's entire roof. While lifting myself from the rubble, I froze upon hearing those deep growls as Fiona, or whatever it was, effortlessly shifted through the fallen debris and exited the dismantled shed. I heard her slowly stop across the lot, followed by another loud crash from her ripping the tavern's back door off its hinges. I waited for the silence to return before emerging out of the rubble, despite injuries to my arm, leg, and back. Something shifting in the debris caught my attention, which I realized was Monsieur Jean. The wooden beam impaled him through his abdomen. Blood spurted from his mouth and smashed nose each time he attempted to exhale. He clearly didn't have much time left, but he wanted his last words to be heard. I loved my wife. He weakly gasped in between bursts of bloody coughs. I had no choice but to bind myself to that evil, that incarnation, for my beloved Elisa's sake. Monsieur Ergin spent his final moments describing the morbid pact that he was forced to make. Two years ago, Madame Elise was severely ill and on the brink of death. The entity first appeared before Monsieur Ergin in the form of an elderly man, herding a bull and ram while he was walking down a nearby country road one night. After affirming its vile nature, the being said that it knew Madame Elise was in grave condition and made a proposition. She would be cured of her illness if Monsieur Jean adhered to the being's will. When he reluctantly agreed, the being made Monsieur Jean swear a blood oath that officially bound him to the entity, who said it would return in a different form. It appeared at the tavern 30 days after Madame Elise's recovery in the form of a seductive beautiful young woman. The being said Monsieur Jean would be used to exclusively unleash his bodily fervors. He was forbidden from ever having intercourse with or show his wife any form of affection. Passing it as the waitress we all knew as Fiona, Monsieur Jean catered to the entity's malicious depravity for over two years, while being painstakingly forced to neglect his wife. When I asked Monsieur Jean the being's name, he fearfully uttered one word. Asmode. You can't imagine my pain being forced to cast my beloved wife aside. Taking this monster far and away from Elise was the ultimate sacrifice I was willing to make. Monsieur Jean sputtered during his final seconds of life. But you sabotaged my plan. Nullified our pact. I watched the life escape Monsieur Jean's face as his body went limp. There was no time to reflect on everything he had just revealed, when a shrill, agonizing shriek came from inside the tavern. I staggered across the lot and entered through the back doorway. The dark corridor led to a private dining room, which was in complete disarray. Among the smashed furniture, shattered glass and porcelain, I noticed chunks of flesh, severed limbs, 
and human entrails strewn across the floor. I spotted shreds of a German uniform along with the Lance Corporal insignia, which is all I needed to deduce that these were Welch's remains. I felt my stomach churn as I was about to vomit. When I turned to leave the room, the door I came in from slammed shut, replacing my nausea with panic when it wouldn't budge open. I turned back just in time to see the door leading into the tavern's front room slowly creak open. I cringed as I slowly crept across the room, each of my steps signified by the crunching of glass and porcelain shards across the floor. My limbs were shaking as fast and uncontrollably as my heart's beat. I slowly entered the front room, which was barely illuminated by a pair of overhead lights and gas lanterns on the bar. Almost every table and chair were also overturned or destroyed. I drew up my pistol and torch, pointing both in the same direction, despite my frantically shaking hands. The torch's light revealed a macabre scene. One of the servers' bodies lay slumped in the corner of a narrow L-shaped staircase leading to the tavern's second floor. A gaping void was where the body's face should be, and her uniform's white button-down shirt was bloodied and littered with deep tears while her entrails were spilled across the staircase's platform. The front room's far-sided chunks of flesh, entrails, limbs, and blood smeared across the floor, along with a nude, limbless, and headless torso propped against an overturned table. My heart sank when I shined the torch upon Madame Elise. Her lifeless body was folded backwards like a piece of paper over a smashed table. A massive, fist-sized chunk of her throat was ripped out, leaving her head barely attached to her body by a slim strip of skin. Her entire forehead was smashed in, and pieces of her ribs and spine pierced through her skin around the crease of her backwardly bent torso. I could still make out the welt on her face from when she was struck by Monsieur Jean, who I now know was trying to protect his wife. As I started walking up to Madame Elise's body, a creaking noise coming from the bar's opposite end made me quickly shine my torch in that direction, where I glanced upon Yager's motionless body that protruded out from behind the bar. He lay next to the kitchen doorway, along with a pair of legs from what I thought was another corpse, but realized that they belonged to him, whose body was ripped in half. Between my smothering, lightheadedness, rapidly beating heart, and violently churning stomach, I was on the brink of succumbing to the unfathomable surroundings when I noticed something glimmer in Yager's hand. The bracelet. I cautiously retrieved the jewel from Yager's rigid grip and thoroughly inspected it with my torch. Aside from the blood coating its surface, the bracelet was smooth, flawless, and lined with a half dozen diamonds that were at least three carats. The bracelet had a small engraving that read, Cape it, 1752, with the family's signature insignia of a shield with three fluors. The bracelet was undoubtedly genuine, which made me forget where I was for a brief second. While enamored with the priceless jewel, the kitchen door slowly opened. Those deep grumbles broke the timid silence. Looking up, I stumbled backwards and I fell to the floor as my wide and terror-filled eyes comprehended the fearsome entity towering over me. I saw Asmodee in its true form. The nude being stood nearly seven feet tall and had a bloated, chunky torso a blotchy, pale, reddish peach skin. Its chunky neck supported three conjoined, skinless faces one of a ram, the swollen face of a man, and a bull, all containing blank, glazed expressions in their beady black eyes. The demon stood on two slim, bird-like legs with thick, sharp talons and filled the room with a piercing odor of decay and sulfur. Unable to take my eyes off of the being, I watched it curiously cant its head while I was observed by its three contorted faces. It stepped alongside Yager's body and released a deep, scraping hiss before glancing down at his upper half. 
The demon lifted and turned Yagra's torso so his limp, dangling head faced my direction. It then slowly sank and wiggled its claw-tipped appendages into Yagra's back, causing his body to convulse before he sprang to life. I nearly lost consciousness from the utter aberrance and astonishment as Yaga released a raspy groan, his unnaturally widened eyes staring directly at me. It hurts, Yaga croakily gasped, his words coated in pure excruciation that sent a sharp, debilitating chill down my spine as the sounds of squishy crunching from the entity's twisting fingers digging deeper into Yager's backside filled my ears. Make it stop. Make it stop. Yager's words quickly transitioned into a constant, elongated moan that escalated into a sharp, agonizing scream. The venomously harrowing suffering in Yager's voice and face broke me out of the entity's mesmerizing hold over me. I blindly aimed my pistol and emptied the clip, hoping to end his suffering. I hit Yager several times, who was unaffected and continued his heightening screams. One of my rounds ricocheted and struck the gas lantern on the bar, which instantly ignited that side of the tavern. In response to my shots, Asmodee grabbed the top of Yager's head with its spare hand, tearing off and crushing his entire forehead like a crumpled piece of paper. Yager's screams persisted until the bean pulled its fingers from Yager's back, at which the life once again vacated his body. As the fire spread, I tried crawling across the front room, but heard the demon quickly close in on me with its thumping steps. The bean lifted me off the ground and turned my body so my face was mere inches from its three. The abomination uttered three words. Sunk name, Tempest, Vignette, in a sunken, gravelly voice, before flinging me through the backroom door. The impact dazed me and made me too disoriented to move. My blurred vision faded in and out as the fire's glow intensified, making me certain that I would burn to death. Right when the flames became visible from where I lay, I heard voices speaking in German and saw three blurry figures burst into the tavern. They were German soldiers that had raced over after hearing the commotion, and they dragged me out in time. When questioned about what had happened that night, I claimed to barely remember anything, but stated that we were ambushed by resistance fighters. The war didn't last long for me after I recovered from my injuries. I was placed into a new regiment but was captured by Allied troops shortly afterwards and put in a POW camp. For me, this was both a blessing and a curse. While I was no longer on the front lines, I fought my own internal battles with the scarring memories of that fateful night. I now know the reality of what evils exist in this world. Evils that exploit the weak and vulnerable in ways far worse than anything we as humans can comprehend. I don't know if I'll ever again encounter Asmodee. Perhaps I won't. If it knows the torment that I continuously suffer from that night's memories, which are forever embedded in my mind. My grandfather drew detailed sketches of the demonic entity in bracelets in the journal, which were as chilling as they were captivating. When I went to show my mother the memoir's translated excerpt, she happened to be going through the contents inside my grandfather's safety deposit box. I think you would like this. My mother excitedly told me before I could say anything, and handed me a worn manila envelope. There is no mention of it anywhere in the will, but it seems like something of your grandfather's that you would cherish. A sharp chill ran down my spine when I opened the envelope, and immediately recognized the item inside. The bracelet, the very one described in my grandfather's memoir.